recent years, we've heard various individuals come up with how the church can grow. We've even seen some congregations bringing in growth experts from denominations to teach how to grow. Some think that the church can grow as a congregation without growing individually. But as I think about the church, we need to realize that the church can only grow collectively as a body, as each member grows individually. We've seen brethren over the past several years, and going back to the bicentennial, I remember that well from that time forward. We've seen brethren right here in our area, and they've come in with their gimmicks and their games and their gadgets and their giveaways, and as long as they're putting things in people's hands, they come. But as one preacher pointed out years ago, when you bring them in with ice cream and coke, you've got to keep giving them ice cream and coke cheap. Because when you stop, they stop coming. Well, they're coming for the wrong reason. It's, it's nothing short of bribery. But what we're talking about is bringing people in, remembering that God says the gospel is the power of God and the salvation. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. It is the gospel that has the power to change the lives of men and women, boys and girls. Look at Saul of Tarsus. Saul changed his entire way of thinking and living not because Ananias was such a great preacher. He changed because of the power of the gospel to change his life. Brethren, we must build up one another and ourselves in the most holy faith. And that growth is going to come through study. It's going to come through knowledge. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. And there is not a one of us here this morning who can say, oh, I've gained that knowledge. I have arrived. I'm there. And there is not a one of us who will live to be old enough to ever make that statement. The Apostle Paul, as he was guided by inspiration, he made that statement. Not that he had arrived, but that he was constantly climbing. He was constantly reaching. He was constantly striving or seeking for that which is above. He knew that he had not arrived. And here was a man who was guided by inspiration. A man who wrote a great majority of the New Testament. And he realized the way to grow. What is the freedom that we enjoy? Well, if you look at the word freedom, especially as we use it today, one definition says it is the condition of not being subject to any restraints that would keep one from deciding for himself his own way or his own destiny. Now, the key words there are free from restraints. Listen to this poem, because this poem perhaps describes freedom so very well. You can hold back the flowing river, dam it up, and keep it from the sea. But every day that river is getting stronger. It's going to break out and flow on naturally. Everything wants to be free. What about you? What about me? You can shoot down a soaring eagle, watch him fall and tumble to the ground, but the soul will just keep right on flying to the sky and it will never die. For everything seeks to be free. Eagles want to fly naturally. Everything wants to be free. How about you? How about me? You can hold me back and beat me to the ground, lock me up and throw away the key. But my voice will cry out to the end, and it will be heard. You just wait and see. Everything seeks to be free. Rivers <coughs> want to flow naturally. Everything wants to be free. Why not you? Why not me? These words to me describe the idea here of freedom. And freedom is something that as human beings we want, something we desire. And when we are denied freedom for a period of time, we'll be like that river that we read about in that poem. We will find a way to break through. It's happened repeatedly throughout the history of civilization. It sometimes takes many months, sometimes years, even, yes, hundreds of years Throughout time, men have been willing to fight and even die for freedom. Empires have been toppled. 
Civilizations have been uprooted in the pursuit of liberty. Men have literally traveled the globe at personal risk and expense in search of freedom. If we go back to the colonial days of our country, the people grew tired of the tyranny of England, the Tea Act, and the Stamp Act, and the various acts of intoleration all went forth to contribute to the idea to rebel, to revolt against England. And the people finally decided to free themselves even though it would take an act of war, they were ready to cut the strings from King George. And you know the results of that freedom. The results of that desire. The American Revolution was born. Our, far, our forefathers had a strong desire for freedom. Freedom to worship. Freedom to live. Freedom to not be told what to do. And it was just one of many examples that we can mention. We can go back into the Old Testament long, long before this country ever was thought of coming into existence. And we find the children of Israel and their desire for freedom in Exodus chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. There the Bible says, And the Egyptians made the Israelites to serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage and order. And in brick. And in all manner of service in the field, all their service they made them serve was with rigor. Verse 24 and 25 of chapter 2. And God heard their groaning. And God remembered the covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. Now remember, these were the descendants of a man by the name of Joseph. Joseph had risen in prominence when he had interpreted Pharaoh's dreams. He was made number two in the kingdom. He had anything and everything that a man could want. When he brought his father and his family into the land of Canaan, they settled in the land of Goshen, the most choice land in all of Egypt. And yet now, now they're serving as slaves. And they have been for several hundred years. And they're yearning for freedom. God hears their prayers. And notice they went to the right source. They went to God, not to a physical ally. Of course, you know the rest of the story. God raised up Moses and his brother Aaron. And Moses became the great deliverer of Israel from Egyptian slavery. Now keep in mind that freedom is not without price. Anytime we desire freedom as Israel did long ago or as our ancestors did many years ago, someone must pay. Often, as we said about the building, we normally don't think about all that goes into the building in a great project like this. We take it for granted. And I would suggest that often we take for granted the freedom that we have, the price that has been paid, not only 200 years, but years ago, There's the price that we have soldiers paying right now around the globe. How many times have families become separated in the quest for freedom? How often have families become divided, brother fighting against brother, husband or father against son, son against fathers in the American Revolution? Loyal ties have been severed as the blood of multiplied thousands mingled to form the river of time. Men, though, who have desired peace have always been willing to pay their price for their dream of freedom, of independence. And what a price has been paid. Again, as we look back at the children of